My you screen know. says well, we're live. Hmm. My screen anyway, says so, we're live. <laughs> screen says we're live. Uh, so there was so that's on me. I apologize to the Facebook world. I thought we were live. Then, then I got an a, a error message, but we're back on. So um, let's get to the fun part. You don't want to hear me talk about error messages on Facebook and so forth. So I sit here tonight with author uh, Selena Baker. Uh, she is the author of The Line of Splendor, a novel of Nathaniel Green and the American Revolution. So we are very excited tonight to have you here with us. Thank you so much for being a part of this, uh, Ms. Baker. And uh, if, let's start with, uh, you, if you want to give a little background on who you are and how did you get to uh, fall in love with Nathaniel Green to write a, a great <laughs> novel about him. Um, I write historical fiction about the Revolutionary War. I have a force book series about it, historical fantasy, actually. Uh, but it does cover the war through Yorktown. And um, so Nathaniel Green was in three of those three of those books, um, which I spent years researching. And when the books were all published, I decided I wanted to write another book related to the Revolutionary War. And I come pretty much obsessed with Nathaniel Green during my series, um, visited his homestead in Coventry, Rhode Island, uh, his grave in Savannah, Georgia. Just So I just um, decided to write a book that he was the focus and his wife, Katie. And uh, I have a degree in computer science, <laughs> so, <laughs> which isn't helpful. <laughs> no, no, it's, I mean, a lot of us come to this field in history for the love of it, we are in some art, uh, some other field, some other thing, um, and so forth. So, um, you, I, uh, this might be a first, and I'm trying to rack my brain as the first person that we had authored that has done a fiction book. So, uh, that we're interviewing here on this Red Bull Revelry. So, um, if not the first, one of the first. So, I've got to ask, um, how hard is it to write a fiction book on a character that is very, very well known? especially in the American Revolutionary War circles? Um, it takes a lot of... I, I was already used to doing research on the Revolutionary War before I started the book on on Nathaniel Green. And, so I, and I had a lot of um, background on him already. But to find things that were primary resources, his letters, um, foundersarchive.com, I mean, you name it, Google Books has all kinds of... Uh, uh, primary resources. Uh, it was actually kind of difficult, but on the other hand, it wasn't that hard because I I knew where I was going with it already. Um, I understood General Green to a, an extent already, and um, I really just enjoyed delving into his life, his wife's life, uh, the people who surrounded him. So I don't think it was hard. It was just laborious, not hard, but a lot of time put into it in, in careful research. Let's talk about these. Uh, let's We'll separate the Daniel and Katie Green. Let's talk about both of them. Because one of the things I really love about this book was their, the personalities came through that you kind of got transported back into the 18th century. And both Nathaniel and Katie Green are very unique people um from just where from their settings how they were raised and so forth so um could you speak a little bit about i mean nathaniel's upbringing and then we'll switch over to katie just to give our uh viewers a little insight into who these two people are more than what you just read in military history books i and then that's kind of a good point bill because i i wanted people to um understand that they were people and that's part of the reason i wrote a novel to take their words and and have them written on a page. Um, but Nathaniel Green was uh, raised a Quaker. And what I, I kind of liked about him was he was a kind of a rebellious teenager. He uh, supposedly used to jump out his bedroom window with his brother Jacob and go dancing and he wasn't supposed to do that. Uh, their dad would whip him with a horse whip when they got home. Um, he was he had a limp. He had asthma. He had a smallpox scar on his right eyeball. It was often infected. And for some reason, I found that endearing because he was a person, a person that had physical challenges. Like we all have something that, you know, we have to deal with in our life. Um, he 
went against the Quaker religion by uh, doing defending people in court for his father's business. He and his cousin Griffin went to a place that the Quakers didn't approve of in Connecticut, and neither him nor Griffin confessed would confess. The, they, the Quakers said, you know, you need to tell us what you did. And they're like, we're not telling you. And um, he ran the family iron forge in Coventry, Rhode Island. He he was, uh, he pounded smelt in tankers with the guys that he managed. He operated it. And um, he cared a lot about his family. And I think that was, that endeared me to him because I could see him just like anybody else today who had a lot of responsibilities and kind of did what they wanted to do in, on the side. So you have, uh, and how does that differ from how, I mean, Katie, I forgive me, her last name, maiden name is jumped out of my head. But yeah. Littlefield. How did Katie Littlefield, uh, from her upbringing, because I was kind of remarkable how you brought her in uh, early on and it showed how she was a unique woman at the time. She was very unique. She grew up on Block Island off the coast of Rhode Island. Uh, her mother died when she was six. So her she went to live with her aunt in Pro, in uh, East Greenwich, Rhode Island, so she could be educated. And the thing about Block Island was her relatives settled there to get away from Massachusetts dogma. So they didn't have a lot of rules there. There weren't any formal schools. There wasn't, there was no formality. Everybody was, could be who they wanted to be for that time period. And so she was a convivial, happy girl and who enjoyed life. And, and uh, I think that's what attracted Nathaniel Green to her. He was in love with some other girl who kept telling him, I'm not marrying you. And she broke his heart. And here Katie's growing up and he's seen Katie in the household of his distant relative, William Green. That's where she's living with her aunt. And he sees that she's grown into a woman and they they end up getting married. She's only 19. He's on about 32. So, yeah, a, a traditional American love story, right? Guy gets broken heart, mm -hmm. walks in, finds this. Uh, be, very intelligent, beautiful lady, and 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 they connect. And so, um, you basically see. I mean, what I liked about how you brought was both of them are kind of unique in their own settings. I mean, um, the Daniel Green is uh, mil militaristic, kind of business oriented, and definitely not a Quaker. Katie doesn't fit into that. I mean, she's ed educated, doesn't have that motherly figure as you brought up. Doesn't quite fit in with some of uh, her new in laws, uh, yes, so to speak. Um, but her, her skill set, she reminded me as you uh, wrote through it as a uh, how much her and Nathaniel uh, mirrored George and Martha Washington, how uh, they that uh, relationship. And so, um, well, let's uh, and I, uh, we have a question actually just came in is uh, in your writings, how did, did Nathaniel Green ever reconcile his Quakerism and military service? Did you find there was any like no. internal struggle? No, not at all. So he was... no, he pretty much walked away when the when the Revolutionary War started. He did have some internal struggles with it when he was confronted with the Quakers in Pennsylvania during the war and in North Carolina. Um, he was a little angry about them not supporting the patriotic cause and doing nothing basically. And so he did still kind of struggle with that. So the struggle there. Um, and so as he moves into the, the revolution, you really pick up, um, you have to mold in a lot of primary sources and then a lot of these uh, conversations, a lot of these, especially happening where they probably didn't write about. How do you construct that language? Uh, that's what I, as a nonfiction writer, that to me almost seems like an impossible task. How, where do you fit in the conversations that aren't, um, aren't in the primary sources? So how did I can uh, evolve conversations out of letters? Yes. Um, get, keep the story going. Yeah, I just I put them in the place that they were in history. Um, for instance, we know Nathaniel Green wrote to George Washington about uh, say he wrote to him about being quartermaster general 
and they exchanged letters about it. I took those letters and made conversations out of them where, where Nathaniel Green was talking to George Washington in camp there together where they were. And this, I mean, this is how they communicated through letters. Um, he and Katie exchanged letters. She was at home with his family a lot of the time. And he wrote to her a lot. She burned her letters to him. But we know what he, we know what she was saying to him through his letters to her. And so I just put them in the places where they really were and had them talk to each other through what they were writing to one another. Sidebar, why did she, she only burnt her letters to him? Mm -hmm. uh, Nobody knows yeah. why. Oh, nobody knows why. It's just okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, interesting. I mean, if you're going to burn them, you usually burn all or, or, or none. But um, Martha Washington did that as well, burned her letters. Yeah. And then some, I thought, yeah, something, and she was pretty exhausted with what she, she burned, making sure that that relationship stayed private. Um, with uh, so. As Nathaniel Green evolves into this leader, uh, do you see a tone in his letters change or does uh, personality change or does he kind of stay stay the same uh, from which, from your research? Um, I, I saw him change. I think he was already very pedantic, uh, attention to detail type person. Um, he cared a lot about people and it started to show as the war dragged on, when he, well, not dragged on, actually when the war moved to New York is when I, I personally could see the pivot of him growing into this general who had never been in battle. He misses the battle of Long Island. He's sick, but he spent all this time worrying about his troops getting sick, their health, uh, clothing them, whatnot. Um, and he's a general who doesn't know hasn't seen battle hasn't seen the horrors of war he sees his first battle at Harlem Heights on September 16th 1776 and he realizes that he doesn't know really know what's you know net, doesn't know how it feels to be in a battle till he's actually in one and now he's starting to learn that he needs to learn to grow and write letters and be aggressive and say, hey, I got these troops. I have this responsibility. And I could see that changing in him as the war went on. Like in the confidence or in just the kind of coming kind of more uh, married to the realism of it or the horrors of it, uh, how did how did that evolve? Um, I think it was out of confidence, although he did advise uh, Washington that Fort Washington was defensible and it fell anyway. Um, he managed to get past that. Washington didn't uh, didn't have him court-martialed. He didn't punish him in any way. And so Nathaniel Green had a chance to say, hey, look what I did. It was really, really a bad choice on my part, but I have a chance to go forward. And he was very sensitive to criticism as well and that was something that was a well-honed part of his personality and he never really cleared that out um for instance at brandywine his uh, division was held in reserve but he was commanding virginians they rode to the rescue at the end of the battle stopped cornwallis from making more of a horror of the battle of brandywine but Washington didn't acknowledge con his uh, division to Congress. And at the end, Green was totally upset. And this was an example of him um, learning to grow, but also still being sensitive to criticism and somewhat aggressive. He got somewhat aggressive with Washington, saying, hey, why are you doing this? And Washington's like, they're Virginians. I can't, I can't say they were great and Congress is going to think I'm favoring my own state. But Nathaniel would press them all the time about this kind of a thing. So as Nathaniel grows matures, you see that, I mean, uh, as I've, I've written about Nathaniel, just in that Valley Forge quartermaster, 
uh, era. And, and I mean, you do see that Nathaniel Green understands the, the view of war. I mean, from uh, getting the public involved, the public messaging, to understanding the rank and file. But he does have that temper uh, as well that uh, that comes through. And he does resign often, or attempts to resign often, especially as the quartermaster. Um, do you see uh, after he starts heading toward the Southern Theater, is there even uh, another change? Um, how, how did you reconcile the Nathaniel Green in the North and the Nathaniel Green in the South? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> I, I kind of liked the Nathaniel Green in the South better just okay. because he had an independent command. And he when he got down there, he was completely mortified. Everything was different. You know, he wasn't used to how things were down in the South and there was no civil authority. Everything was a civil war, partisan war down there. And he, uh, he stepped up to the plate and he learned everything he could learn about that area and the people that were down there like Francis Marion, Thomas Huntner, the militia, Andrew Pickens. Um, this is where I could see him grow into his own where he didn't have Washington constantly there um, and he had very little resources to work with and he learned to do that. I think uh, some of that upbringing of, I mean, you start at the beginning of the book about the, with the burning of the forge and the house and so forth. And um, and I really thought that was an interesting uh, starting point to, for the tag, you know, as you did, because it shows so much that a lot of his life is rebuilding from a tragedy or rebuilding from nothing. So did, uh, was that a intentional start uh, by starting with him looking at the place burning? <laughs> yes. Uh, it was. Um, that's why I didn't start with his childhood. Uh, he was 28, I think, when the forge burned, the iron forge burned down. And he's still in love with Nancy Ward at the time. And then their ship, the Fortune, gets confiscated the next year, the Green Brothers ship. And so there's con he's constantly dealing with these kind of things with his business. Um, so, yeah, I started it out like that so we could see that he was capable of standing up to the most difficult situations uh, right off the bat. So, you know, so Nathaniel Green standing up to these difficult um, things, and then you see him through through the war. Uh, now, near the end, does his, for those who don't know, does his writings pick up? Do they lessen? Because as he heads to the Southern Theater, he seems to be doing, I don't know if he ever slept. I mean, that, that's the, the big question. So That's a big question. Uh, well, was um so how do did you find it easier or harder to write in the southern about the southern theater? No, I found it is about the same. He was a prolific writer. His 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 volumes of, of papers. His grandson George Washington Green has had uh, his papers as well, and um, so there was lots of writing uh, that I was able to find for both the north and the south. I in the South, I did find a lot of writing for between people like uh, Light Horse Harry Lee and Otha Hall and Williams and John Eager Howard, the the principals who fought for him in, in the war. Um, a lot of letters between them themselves, and um, I think it was probably equal as far as the difficulties of finding. Uh, writings for the north versus the south and with the principal characters there um any uh interesting tidbits do you like the, the you, you came up in all slight that were fascinating that you had to add to the book or and vice did any not make it into the book that you thought were interesting these letters and conversations uh, any that did not make it into the book First, any that didn't make it into the book to give a teaser for people to, to, to read it, like, hey, this was a cool find between, say, Light Horse Harry Lee and Nathaniel Green um, that you thought had that aided the story. We'll go with that, number one, and then anything that didn't make it into the book, number two. Yeah, I found some really interesting things about what uh, Light Horse Harry Lee felt about Nathaniel Green. I spent a lot of time writing about the two of them talking to each other. Um William Washington, his cavalry commander in the South, wasn't such super fascinating, but I 
he was a heroic uh, at Cal Pens. He was he worked hard. He was a great cavalry commander. Um, I liked writing about Francis Marion and Nathaniel Green, although they didn't meet each other that often. Uh, Thomas Sumner was cranky, and he didn't want to cooperate with Nathaniel Green. L literally cranky, and so um, that was still kind of fun. He tried to resign and give his commission to Nathaniel Green, and Nathaniel's like, I can't take this because your commission came from South Carolina governor. Um John Rutledge, it, just little interesting things like that that came up. Um, I enjoyed writing about Otho Holland Williams. I didn't know a whole lot about him. Uh, I think people have read about him if you've read the Maryland 400. Um, the um, He's in that book. Uh, <clears throat> he was an interesting character to write about. Um, very debonair, debonair and, and full of himself. And I liked him a lot. Because he's a true Maryland friend, being a Marylander myself, we we are debonairs and uh, have been told we're full of ourselves at times. But uh, yes, and uh, he, in, but he was intelligent and he knew what he was doing. And I, I loved him. So. See, you heard it. And, and I, I didn't pay uh, Selena to actually say that there's nice things about Marylanders. I know that I'm one of the only Marylanders in the Emerging Revolutionary War group, but, um, and Otho Williams is actually, uh, I did my graduate work, my fir uh, first graduate work on Otho Williams in the Maryland line, so I really oh, um, you I did. Just, oh. was just out of Williamsport, Maryland yesterday, which is named in his honor. Um, I know. Granted, I was there to get a beer, but I'd been to his gravesite before, but uh, I'd is, like yeah, to see very that. interesting guy. What was that? So it's uh, he's an am amazing guy, but yeah, one of those characters, along with uh, that, New Green has to ne negotiate in the South, and so I uh, liked how you you brought these different characters in and really showed how Green had a political suaveness to him that um, most people it only is glanced upon in a lot of military histories. So um, I have some what if questions later that we can all uh, throw. But um, so as we move to the end of the war, how to um, let's walk through the, the green that transitions from the military back into civilian life. Did you, um, can you re reconstruct that for, for our listeners? Um, I'll quickly start with the fact that when he was commanding troops in the South um, by 1782, well, he wasn't getting any help anyway down there, very little help. Uh, but he was, after the British uh, evacuated Charleston in December 1782, he was responsible for uh, clothing and providing for his troops, but Congress wasn't forthcoming with money. Uh, he, Nathaniel Green ended up signing a, a guarantee for 30,000 pounds with a Charleston speculator named John Banks. Uh, well, he went into a contract with John Banks to, to provide provisions for his troops. Uh, banks speculated the money. Congress didn't pay banks. Banks are not giving you the provisions unless you sign a guarantee. And so Nathaniel signed that guarantee for 30,000 pounds. A huge amount of money he didn't have. Um, he was gifted uh, plantations in South Carolina and in Georgia. And he also did invest in land in Cumberland Island, Georgia. Uh, but he was forced to borrow money from the Marquis de Lafayette, the superintendent of finance, Robert Morse, and others. He went home to Rhode Island in November 1783. And he the Greens didn't have their own home. The, the Green homestead in Coventry at Rhode Island had gone back to his family. So he's living in a rented house in Newport with Katie and their four kids. And Nathaniel can't clear himself of this crushing debt. It keeps going back to South Carolina to try to find this creditor who's, who's, uh, he's angry with John Banks and uh, he finds John Banks is dead. And so now he feels like he's never going to get out of his debt. He goes back home to Newport. Uh, they decide to move to Mulberry Grove in Savannah, Georgia, one of the plantations that he was gifted in the South. They 
their family moves down there and he takes that crushing debt with him. So they um, they get settled in Mulberry Grove, but he doesn't live that much longer after they uh, get down there. They got down there in October or left in October 1785, left Rhode Island and sailed to Savannah, arrived in late 1785. And they actually only lived there about six months before he died under crushing debt still. And, um, you want, uh, for those of the readers um, that don't know, of course, that Hagen Green, they believe, died of sunstroke, correct? Yes, yes. Yes, they and, do uh, believe he died of sunstroke. So that's why I said stay hydrated, folks. Um, and uh, be, But uh, what happens, uh, did you continue to research into what happens with Katie Green uh, oh, after yes. the death? It's yeah. after... Uh, when you get to the end of the book, you'll see it afterward. And it tells what happened after Nathaniel died. As far as like Light Horse Harry Lee wrote to George Washington to tell him uh, his burial, etc. And then there's also a section there on Katie, what happened to her after Nathaniel died as well. So um, I did put some of that at the end of the novel. And it's um, all completely nonfiction. I mean, the forward or afterward is complete. This is what happened to them. So, um, with that, so those are the the, the highlights of this book. So, how did you, how did you weave the narrative? I that's the I mean, in nonfiction books, we go okay, it's chronological, it's this and that. We don't have to worry about filling in gaps in the story. So, uh, for at least for my personal view, I, um, writing a fiction book is beyond my skill set. So I'm fascinated how you crafted a and we did a nonfiction and fiction aspect. So how does how does that work? Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I just you have to feel the emotion, of what's going on at all times, and, but you also have to keep in mind that what you're writing is is history, real history, but it's also historical fiction. So we need to know how people felt. Um, and that's why I chose to write a novel they, versus a biography. Um, so I knew where everybody was, where they were at uh, at the time. They're either they're in Pennsylvania, they're in New York, they're in South Carolina, wherever they're at. Um, so I just weaved in the movements of what they would have done as a person you know um this is what they were doing this is what they were writing to one another this is what history recorded they were doing i did use secondary resources as well um so i just tried to keep a picture of them as people in my mind you know people who could smell the rain coming or see the moon full or feel a breeze in their hair or or cry or as Nathaniel Green suffered with asthma he'd write to people all the time my asthma's bothering me I mean how I don't have asthma but how would you feel if you did have asthma and you're in the middle of a battle and there's smoke everywhere and you know or you're exhausted because you don't get any sleep like you said you got very little sleep in the south how does he feel if, you, if you're exhausted and you're trying to worry about the enemy always on you, worry about what's going on in camp? And how do you feel when one of your officers uh, insults or one of your soldiers insults his, his officer? I mean, how are you going to feel? You wanna, you're want you going to make him be whipped? Are you going to hang them? How are you going to feel about that if that's you making that decision? How did Nathaniel Green feel about it is a whole nother thing. So I had to get to know him like a person. And and I, that's that's the basis of all of that was getting to know him as a person and trying to understand him as a person, not just a, a general. Uh, part of this writing where you just said Nathaniel like, what are you thinking or what are you doing like just ah like 
<laughs> Did you get frustrated with Nathaniel at all? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> His sensitive to criticism was sometimes over the top. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, really? You, you keep complaining about the same thing over and over again. But it's part of his personality. He's pedantic. He's attention to detail. He makes himself known when he's writing his letters. His letter to Congress when he uh, resigned as quartermaster general is something else. Boy, I'll tell you. <laughs> he was like letting loose on them. I told you I hated this and you're not listening to me. And I've been telling you for over a year and I, my rank is high in this army. And, you know. And yeah, he can, he's pretty wise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so we did it uh, the ah, there was there any time where you like, even when you're writing, you're thinking, wow, this guy seems larger than life. Like, we always hear about oh. George Washington, I always view Nathaniel Green as right there as like the uh, I don't want to say the poor man version, but the understudy to George Washington in that regard. So, is there any yeah. instance that we just kind of fell in love or had empathy or just went, wow. With Nathaniel Green? Yeah. Yeah. I fell in love with him from the very beginning. So I'm <laughs> biased. <laughs> I just, uh, you know how sometimes you meet people? Okay, I know he's dead and it's going to sound silly, but you meet people and you really like them. And other times you meet people and you're like, oh, they're okay. But, you know, you kind of meet some people you click with. And I, I felt that way about Nathaniel Green. Like he was someone I could understand. Um, someone I could relate to. Maybe it's partially because I had some of the same qualifications. Like I'm overly attentive to detail or whatever. Um, wa writing about Washington and the others wasn't quite as uh, daunting because they were not the main focus. Um, they were extremely important, and I have lots of references and Washington's letters as well. Martha Washington as well. Uh, I just, I don't know. Found, I was also uh, attracted to Katie as a person. Um, she could have been my friend. So. No, that's what, um, when the book came across uh, for the um, Revolutionary War group, uh, one of the reasons I nabbed it is that I, uh, years ago, I read, I think, the late Cookie Roberts or like founding mothers or founding daughters or so forth. And and she wrote about how um, Katie Green or Kitty Green and, and so forth. And you realize, wow, um, her, Martha Washington, even Lucy Knox and so forth, these yeah. they don't get the credit that they deserve as part of this this powerful duo. Um, and then Nathaniel right, Green and those is are, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But, uh, no, go on. Those are the three ladies I uh, concentrated most on actually in the novel was uh, Katie, Martha Washington, and Lucy Knox, uh, because they were friends. I mean, there's a, a triumvirate behind the traditional triumvirate of the Re Revolutionary War. I mean, they're just amazing uh, people in their own right. Um, backtracking a little bit, we got a question come in, and I, and I think we didn't cover it earlier, but it's one thing everyone knows about Nathaniel Green right away is the lip. And so uh, someone did ask, uh, how did Nathaniel Green get his lip? And so um, pass that it over is, to you. That's a good question, but that's totally unknown. There's um, different theories that, like I said earlier, he would jump out the window, his bedroom window to go to dances. Uh, he might have gotten his limp working the trip hammer in the Iron Forge. He might have been born with it. Um, there's at, no one knows at all the cause of it. No, uh, uh, part of part of his mystique of Nathaniel Green. Um, mm -hmm. Another question uh, that came in uh, was that: uh, Did you run across any uh, comments Green did about uh, runaway uh, enslaved African Americans? Anything of uh, about runaway enslaved yes. African Americans? Not that specifically. No. So you got it. All right. Um, and so um, thanks for the questions. Keep them coming, folks, uh, in as well. But um, is there something that uh, came out of this book about uh, the revolution that either changed your perspective or 
well, then we refer to it in the National Park Service as the aha moment when you can reach the audience and they have this aha. Did you have an aha moment of like, I didn't know that. So I had a lot of aha moments that I didn't know, honestly. <laughs> um, just when you start digging deep into something like this, every little thing is a aha. And I had to not include all of those in the book, only some of them, because otherwise the book's long, as you know, it would have been longer. Um, I think that the war in the South was more of an aha for me as far as what was really going on down there, how difficult it was for everyone. I, you know, you see the movie, The Patriot, and everybody's like, yeah, that's a stupid movie, whatever. But there's some truth behind that movie, what was going on down there, the burning, the the um, the loyalists and patriots fighting each other. And Nathaniel Green, that upset him. He's very upset about seeing people, women and children hiding in the woods and and whatnot. And I think a lot of that uh, was an aha moment for me to see how this man felt about seeing other people suffer. So yeah, in that uh, same vein, I mean, the, the kind of the army uh, trying to have a, um, a lot of, I mean, there was a lot of disparity of age. So did uh, Nathaniel Green ever remark about like, hey, there was maybe kids as young as 12, 13, old men, like the composite of his army. Did that ever um, get into his writings? Like those feelings about, wow, we the suffering goes across generations. Um, not specifically, but I think that that he was probably riding toward that type of thought process, um, because he was shocked to see what was going on down there. Um, and there were many young kids that were especially in the militia and older men in the militia too, which he wasn't real big on militia, but he had no choice, so. Seen what, especially from coming from the north, northern theater to the southern theater, uh, old militia, and especially his predecessor had uh, Horatio Gates at Camden. Um, <laughs> right. Someone, uh, I uh, do have a uh, kudos from the uh, from the book. Uh, someone's reading it. Uh, Walt is, and he's glad you included the Molin House because he lives five minutes from there. <laughs> so he's giving you oh. uh, the kudos there. So thank uh, you so much. Um, as <laughs> thank well. you. So. Um, so with uh so um not to move on from Nathaniel Green, but uh is so can we expect another book of this about maybe Knox or someone else? Is or am <laughs> I is there what's in the works next? Um, um I had a lot of people I wanted to write about, Otho Hall and Williams, by the way, being one of them, but um I'm writing a bi biographical novel about Dr. Joseph Warren. Um, he was in the first book of my historical fantasy series about the American Revolution. And I, so now I wanted to write a proper biographical novel about him. Um, he was my first obsession. Don't tell Nathaniel Green. And so I'm working on that. Um, there's other people in the wings. I only have so much time. But uh, Henry Knox is also a possibility. I loved writing about Knox and he was one of Nathaniel Green's closest friends. I mean, even that um, at the beginning, I mean, what is it, Green and Knox's relationship in, in the bookstore as they uh, read and move? And then um, I got to ask this question. I don't know if you uh, know the answer to it, though, but uh, since you're now starting to write, did Green and Warren ever cross paths when Green was visiting Boston to, to get books that he wasn't supposed to? I don't, I can't say specifically if they did, but my guess is yes. Uh, Green reported uh, General Artemis Ward when he reported to the Siege of Boston. Um, of course, Artemis Ward worked closely with Dr. Joseph Warren. Uh, Nathaniel being a general, a provincial general at the time, he had to have worked with them uh, at some point. He missed the Battle of Bunker Hill because uh, he went home to Rhode Island and it you know, he, he might have been killed there if he hadn't, but I would say they did, they had to, that's my assumption. They had to have met. Just have to wait to, to read your next book, right? To see if there's <laughs> a conversation that uh, ensues. Um, right. 
you thought about the Green family. Um, did you uh, dive into any writings? Uh, how far did you get into like some of his other family members, like Christopher Green or his brothers and so forth? Did you any rabbit yeah. holes in going that those routes as well? That's a good question. Um, I did not get into uh, his brother's background that much. His uh, brothers, especially his older brother, Jacob, was involved in doing some provisioning with the army. And he was the one that was basically watching out after Katie. Um, that's pretty much the depth I got into with Jacob. Um, uh, Christopher Green, I didn't get into him in the book. But he was interesting and in what happened to him is sad. Uh, it's probably worth writing. Um, however, I had to limit, like I said, the length of the book. So uh, Christopher Green got just mentioned, and that's it. So uh, on that uh, vein with the book, um, where can people get copies of the book uh, now that uh, it's available? It's on Amazon. Um, you can also go to my website selinabbaker.com and you can click through the books there which will take you to Amazon as well and uh, for all those um, that um, we will put I'll drop that in the chat before we're done tonight to make sure, uh, the link to uh, Selena's website so you can order um book and of course as you know from any hi uh, history world and I even got the question right off the bat are there signed copies available um uh, or how, or how they can you get a signed copy? Um, you can get one from me directly. Uh, I'm on Facebook, Selena Baker, B. Baker. Um, if you find my author's page, you can DM me or you, and you just message me on Facebook and say, hey, can I get a signed copy? Then I'll have you uh, email me and I can give you the information about how to do that. Or you have my email address as well, so I don't mind if it's public. So yeah, we'll drop. Uh, so what we'll do is drop the uh, the website or uh, in the comments. We'll also say you can reach out to her on uh, on social media and so forth. Any speaking engagements? Any tours upcoming anywhere? <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I speak to the uh, Sons of the American Revolution, Daughters of the American Revolution chapters here in texas uh, i've spoken to a lot of them i have one in march in college station i'm also going to be in pennsylvania in may at black powder tavern in wayne uh, speaking about general green and at summer seat in morristown uh, pennsylvania and this is may 19th and may 21st um, those are my most recent um, scheduled events so if you're out in, in those areas, um, and I, I assume those dates are also on your uh, website or if you want to follow up. I'm bad about putting those dates. <laughs> oh. Well, they just have to listen to this then or, or re-listen to it to find I'll out just, where you're at. I'll post stuff on my uh, Facebook page and I usually post on social media. Hey, I'm going to be doing this um, to let people know where I'll be with, with General Green. Uh, and as we... Um, Kind of wrap up here at the few minutes left. Um, any final thoughts? Is there something that you really wanted to get out through this book to people about Nathaniel Green? I just, uh, I think basically I just wanted, I know that people here tonight know who Nathaniel Green is, but not a lot of people know um, who he is as well. And I think that I just wanted people to know I wrote this book so that we could get to know him as a man and not just a lofty major general, that he was a person, uh, as I said before. And um, I just hope that everybody enjoys the book. Um, it's historically accurate. Of course, it is a novel, so I had to take some liberties as far as having people speaking to one another. Um, but it's, it's a true book about his life. And I hope people enjoy it. And I'm super excited to be in here tonight. Oh no, it's a uh, I mean a wonderful book, and if um, not even just about uh, I mean myself as a historian, but the guy who wrote your uh, Ford as well. I mean, uh, is a, a great historian. <laughs> you uh, know him. And mm -hmm. So I mean, yeah, 
Rick Ferreira. So, I mean, there it is to show what, how this blends fiction and nonfiction so seamlessly. Uh, don't take it from a guy wearing an Orioles polo. You can take it from <laughs> the professor at the, uh, one of the uh, U.S. Army War Colleges as well. Um, people are, are raving now uh, saying thanks for uh, putting the book together. Uh, so people are eager to dive into it. Um, I left this joke for near the end because most nonfiction books have a big footnote section. But this might be one of the first books that I've read cover to cover because you can actually do that uh, word to word. So, <laughs> um, but uh, so I do appreciate uh, Selena being on tonight. Uh, thank you again for uh, helping with some of the technical glitches uh, uh, in the beginning here. Um, but uh, make sure uh, you guys check out her book, uh, The Lion of Splendor, a novel of Nathaniel Green and the American Revolution. Definitely worth the read. Um, Definitely worth a spot on your bookshelf. Um, for those that uh, follow at EmergingRevolutionaryWar.org, we, we thank you for joining us for another month. Uh, we are closing in on four years here at uh, doing this, what we call the Red War Revelry. In two weeks, though, uh, we will have a pre-recorded one. Emerging Revolutionary uh, War will have a roundtable discussion about the Irish contributions in the American Revolution. Not sure why we're picking March 17th to do that, but uh, tune in and... Uh, listen in on why the Irish played a role as well. Um, and if you want to hear more about, uh, especially the early part of the war in uh, Massachusetts, please uh, head over to our website, emergingrevolutionarywar.org. So uh, check out the link for the uh, bus tour this year happening in October, which will go to Massachusetts. Um, and although Nathaniel Green's not there in April, Dr. Warren is. You can start learning the history to get ready for Selena's next book uh, on Dr. Warren coming out. Um, so once again, thank you, everyone, uh, for tuning in. Um, thank you as well for um, your support of Emerging Revolutionary War. Go buy uh, Selena's book. And um, thank you again. Have a good evening. And thank you, Ms. Uh, Baker, for uh, spending your evening with us. Thanks, Phil. And thank you to everyone who came and, and listened. I appreciate it very much. And good night, everyone. Uh, take care. And we'll see you in two weeks back here on Red War, Red War.